Good morning, Foundry Church Online. We are the Jacobus family. My name is Matt. I'm Shauna. This is Ben. I'm Riley. And I'm and what's his name? And we worship along with you from Puyallup, Washington. Hey, good morning, everyone, and happy Father's Day to all of you dads out there. Uh, my name is Jeff Animal, and I'm the online venue pastor and ministry director here at the Foundry Church. And it's great to have you joining us for our worship service today. And I just encourage, if you live anywhere in the West Michigan area, to come check out one of our in-person services. We meet at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 7 p.m. on Monday nights. Um, we'd love for you to join us if you are able to do so. Um, also, if you'd like to stay up to date and connected with everything that's happening at the Foundry, um, you can text the keyword Foundry Online to 94000 and press the number one key. I have a few different announcements to share with you this morning. First, our devotionals. These devotionals are written by our team of writers and are available to you for free. At the Foundry Church, we believe in transformation, that we're called to transform in the image of God, and that it's so important to be in the Word of God. So these devotionals include the whole book of Proverbs and will encourage you in your, and challenge you in your faith. And also for this series, we're adding in the pamphlet called Intersections. Um, and this contains different scriptures that you can read throughout the week that will prepare you for what the pastor is going to be talking about on Sunday. So if you haven't grabbed either of these, I encourage you to do so um, as soon as you can. Uh, you can come anytime to the West Stores in the airlock down there and you'll find a hard copy. You can go online to our website, um, foundrychurch.net, and you'll find an electronic copy. Or if you live outside of West Michigan and you would like a hard copy of the book or the pamphlet, send me an email online at foundrychurch.net, and I'll make sure that one gets shipped out to you. I also just want to say thank you um, for the giving of your offerings and God's tithes. If you'd like to give to the Foundry, there's a few different ways you can do so. You can go onto our website, foundrychurch.net, click on the Give tab, and follow those instructions. Or, if you'd prefer, you can mail us your offering. The address of our church is up on the screen right now. I'm so excited to share with you this morning that this coming Saturday, June 26th at 5.30 p.m., we are going to be having an event called Foundry Summer Nights. Um, this is going to be a time for you to come with your family and eat some food, um, play some outdoor games, and we'll have activities for the kids. And it's just going to be a time for us to come together as a community and connect with one another. So I encourage you to come on out this week, Saturday, June 26th at 5.30 p.m. And this morning, I have an army of children, of babies, that I get to introduce to you this morning. And they are Ember Alexis Pena and Sydney Joy Pena, who were born to Corey and Samantha Pena. Wesley Bereiki, who was born to Noah and Miranda. Kinley and Carly Siang, who was born to Ronnie and Jessica. Blakely Elise Gilson, who was born to Zach and Delaney. And all of those babies and their parents are doing well, so we praise God for that. And Selah Faye Bloomers, who was born to Andrew and Samantha Bloomers. And after she was born, she needed to have surgery, um, but we praise God because the surgery went well. She is currently at Helen DeVos Children's Hospital where she is recovering. So lift up little Selah as she's in the recovering process. And also all of these families as they transition into life of being parents and adding an extra member or even two to their household. All right, we're just about ready to begin with worship. Before we do, let's open with a word of prayer. Pray with me. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that we get to gather. We get to worship you in this space. And God, I just praise you. I'm just thinking of all these babies that um, have been born into the Foundry community and um, all these just precious individuals that you have plans for. Um, I pray that you'd give their parents wisdom as they raise these children. And um, I pray that these children, God, that they would, they would grow up to know you, to love you, and desire to have a relationship with you. And Lord, I pray as we worship, as we learn more about you this morning, I pray that you open our hearts for what you have for us. And um, Lord, may we um, just, just be able to put away all the distractions and just come into your presence. We love you, Lord. Uh, we surrender this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, good morning, Foundry Church. Uh, we are so thankful that you chose to worship with us this morning. Uh, we just want to see you just go after God with everything that you are. So uh, it says in Psalm 66, shout for joy to God, all the earth, sing the glory of his name. 
Uh, so God, we just thank you, Lord, that you are here. God, that your presence is with us. And God, I pray that as we move into this time of worship, God, that we would just surrender everything that we are. Thank you, Jesus. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Where you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways, all your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust. It's Eric Zuber Incorporated. Hey, man. What up there, Thanks Maddie for the ride. Anytime. Oh, I love this song. Do you like it? Whoa! No. <laughs> <laughs> Trouble sneeze. Is that? Oh. I'll go low. Okay, I'll go high. Okay. I like that. My lighthouse. <laughs> My like, lighthouse. You know what? It's good. Uh, we should, yeah. I, maybe we should just get Chick Fil A. I was wondering why I've never been asked to sing. <laughs> I love Chick Fil A. I know that'll, you do. That'll actually give us a time. I've had a question that okay. you know we've it actually gave me some time. But can we go to church first? I may have forgotten something. Oh, oh. yeah. So I mean, the the foundry Uber was to Chick Fil A, so there will be an upcharge. There, okay. Just think of this as being supersized. Super, super yeah. size me. Okay. Just no, on no, the no. way to the foundry, but that'll give me a chance. I've been thinking about my calling, and I've actually been looking at 
um, Isaiah's calling, and I've had some questions about that. I wonder if I could quick run you through that on our way. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I'll quick grab the Bible a minute. So it says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord highly and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him, the seraphim, which are the angels, yeah. um, each with six wings, two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is I full of... interrupt. Look, that dude's like... He is chasing us. Yeah. And he's, he's right next catching to us. us. My word, okay. he's passing us. I'm going to just keep going. Okay. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook, and their temple was... was why, why is he right next to us? Hello? Hello. I think I can help you. Do you understand what you're reading? Uh, I guess not really. Do you want to hop in? Yeah, I can hop in. Okay. So this is what we've been working through. Oh, the prophet Isaiah? I love this book. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Philip. Foundry Church, it is so good to be back with you this week as we're working into week three on our summer series, asking some of the questions, these little thought bubbles that pop up, and, and we have these questions about life. And today I want to introduce you to Philip the Apostle. And Philip the Apostle, as you saw in the video, had this unique story where the Spirit of God compelled him to go and run alongside this chariot that was being, uh, that was occupied by an Ethiopian eunuch who was an executive to the Queen's court. But more on that next week because I want to actually back up just a little and dial in on what Matt was saying in the van during the video that his calling, what does that look like before John, who was our Philip and is a crazy fast runner, came running alongside the van. You noticed Matt was wrestling with his calling and the calling of Isaiah and these different things. And when we talk about calling, we tend to think that there are two kinds of Christians. We think there are Christians who have big dramatic moments of repentance and tra and like and forgiveness and transformation, uh, you know, out of this old life into this new and, and calling into life in missions or a calling into a life in the pastorate. But here's the thing. We also think there's other Christians who are, who live a normal life and maybe they're not called to the ministry or something and we look at them and we think um, that we worry, what if Jesus sends me somewhere? What if Jesus takes me and, and these more normal Christians who don't have the, the big you know, dramatic change but, but they've grown up knowing him, what, they begin to wonder, well, what if Jesus sends me somewhere? And we think there's two different kinds of Christians, kind of the awesome on the edge thing and then the quieter. I feel like the, the idea of it is more meek and genteel Christianity, the more normalized Christianity. And we look at that and, um, and I think one thing we need to do on this is dial in. I want you to hear this. The call and the life in Christ is never about destination. It is actually about transformation into the person of Jesus Christ. Hear that again. The call into the life in Christ is never, it's not about destination. He will call you to different places. It may be different places locally or internationally. He will call you to different places, but it's not about destination. It's about transformation. Transformation, the transformation from you and your sinful nature into the very image of Jesus Christ. So what I think we have to do is look at this idea, this understanding of testimony insecurity. Yeah, I like that phrase. Testimony insecurity. If you've ever been around a group of, of people who are sharing their testimonies and maybe um, you're sitting there listening and one guy's like, yeah. I was in a gang and I beat people and stole cars and, um, you know, like smuggled drugs and did all these horrible things and I met Jesus, all the addictions fell off, I'm a new person and now I do ministry in the prisons and you're like, I grew up in a Christian home. 
And now I have testimony and security because I don't. I didn't have to do that. I didn't. I didn't run a gang, right? I wasn't part of the Latin Kings, or I wasn't part of this horrible gang. Uh, you know, whatever. You, you. I didn't do those things. So maybe I have testimony and security. And the reality for us can be that we have. Um, that we have this idea that these huge testimonies are, are better than the testimony of another person who maybe grew up in a Christian home where the word of God was read every day and they were taught the stories and understood the grace of Jesus Christ at a young age and their life in some way um, was, was maybe a little more sheltered and it was protected and they didn't do all those awful things but I wanna tell you something. The, the gangster who committed murder and, and is the worst, you know, it doesn't have to be a gangster, just a person who has done monstrous things and, and came to Jesus Christ and laid a mountain of unmovable sin at the foot of the cross, needed Jesus just as badly as the person who grew up in a home where Jesus was taught, where they never really like committed those big sins and they grew up knowing the grace of God and then receiving it and they, they didn't do anything bad. That person, the good and I would say the more normal meek and mild testimony, that person needs Jesus and is on the same road to hell that the person who's committed monstrous, monstrous acts is. They weigh the same in God's eyes. Sin is sin. And Jesus died to forgive us of our outward sins, but he also died to forgive us and redeem our sinful nature. Our testimony insecurity is, um, it is a lie. It's a lie. So to say that one horrible person needs Jesus more than the person who grew up in a Christian home and, um, and eventually just gave their life to Jesus and has lived a quiet, faithful life, to say that one outweighs the other is not true. I would say to say one needs Jesus more than the other is a lie from the pit of hell. And it will deceive many good people into hell. Well, I never did those things. I'm okay. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about are you in Christ? Is your life hidden with Christ in God? That idea of testimony and security is so unbiblical. It doesn't matter your sins. It just matters that they're forgiven. All of them. They're completely forgiven. Philip reminds me of my friends who met Jesus when they were young. The Apostle Philip reminds me of one of those. But as you will see, even though the moment their life encountered Jesus, things changed, but, but at the same time, um, you, you watch them and Jesus continues to intersect their lives in various ways and transform them um, and give them the moments where they are challenged to grow beyond where they're at and move forward with him in ministry and purpose in humility and transformation. Just as dramatic on the inside as the transformation of someone who was horrible and did all these bad things. Philip reminds me of someone who knew Jesus from a very young age and loved him and trusted trusted him from a very young age. It doesn't seem like a huge conversion, but it had monumental impact on the kingdom of God. It's a simple call and a simple response for Philip. It's a quick response from him. Check this out. In John chapter one, verse 43 to 51, the next day, Jesus decided to leave Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one whom Moses wrote about in the law and, the, and whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Literally, Jesus said, follow me, and Philip's like, all right. There's no huge thing. It was just this simple obedience. It was as though, he, I mean, look at him. His life would, was so calm about it. He just received him. He received the call and he followed and he went after him. How easy it seems. But here's the reality. It still was courageous. Follow me. Philip's like, all right. And he set his face and he followed Jesus. And once Philip's heart heard this, it resonated with him. And on resonating with him, he began to follow Jesus. And we know that he was familiar with Scripture, with the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, Genesis through Malachi. He knew them. 
He was obviously schooled in them because he said when he went and found Nathanael, we have found the one whom Moses wrote about and the prophets wrote about. He knew what he was talking about because he had been in the scriptures. He had grown up knowing the word. So when he met with Jesus, he believed. He didn't understand totally, and I think that's part of it. We want to have it figured out sometimes. But know this, Philip's life reveals that he didn't understand it all. He didn't get it all, but the one thing he do did understand is the importance of Jesus and he would trust him and learn from him and let Jesus like a potter mold his life into the very image of Christ himself. He would do that. He was one of the first to say to others, come and see this one who invited me to call him. Come and see this man who was written about by Moses and the prophets. Come and see Jesus of Nazareth. His life has this gentleness to it that is, um, don't ever mistake calm and gentle for passive and weak. I love the idea that he was confident to just step forward and do that. So you may have had the privilege of growing up in a home where the word of God was taught and you may have responded very early to Jesus and I want you to know that when he said follow me and you believed with childlike faith, you stand in the great lineage of someone like like Philip. What a blessing, what a gift. That is a kindness of God that you didn't have, you didn't go through all those things. Bless God for that. But make no mistake, your life is called like Philip's life was called to moments of growth. There is no stagnation in this. In a life that chooses early to follow Jesus, what might stand out to you more is the moments where Jesus challenged you, challenged you beyond your small preconceptions, your small ideas of him, and he challenged you to see bigger, to obey in things that made no sense. He may have challenged you to believe or to act. The moments where you stood up against the culture as a child and said, I'm not going to do that. It doesn't seem right to me. And though frightened, you stood up and did that because Jesus gave you moments of growth and he challenged you where you responded and you grew like a tree well-rooted. You grew in that. And I love this. It's, it's not just growth. It's like where you were stamped. You, were, you had something stamped onto you. It changes you. The memories of that are, are sealed and kind of burned or branded into your mind as moments where you responded faithfully and it was frightening and all the emotions and the hormones of standing up and being like, I'm gonna be different in a world of sameness. I have to obey. And when you do those things and you have those moments of growth, you find yourself growing not more into your better self, but being literally, you are being chipped away and Christ's image is being um, transformedly bound into you. And you find these moments. You find these moments with Jesus just like Philip did. Philip had a lot of moments with Jesus. I would like to read to you a story out of John chapter six, verses one to 14. And really, it's a great story. Many of us in the church are familiar with this story, but here's the thing. In this story, what we find is Philip having a moment of growth. And you see the tenderness of Jesus who called him, not to his best self, but to be transformed. Check this out, John chapter six, one to 14. It says this, Sometimes, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had done. He had performed these um, by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish pastival, Passover festival was near. And when Jesus looked up and saw the great crowd fill, uh, coming towards him. So Jesus looks up. I want you to think like a U of M game or a Michigan State game or wherever you live with the universities and you see people crowding towards the stadium. I'll never forget going to a U2 concert at Soldier Field and we started walking down Michigan Avenue and we were up on the northern side by Wacker there on Wacker Drive and we were coming down and as we walked down, there were like crowds of people building and we were all like, are you going to the concert? By the end, the streets were clothes, no more cars want them, and a herd of a 70,000 of us were going in, and you could, you could just see it, and I wondered, like, is the band, like, looking out from the suites, seeing these people coming? That's what I picture with Jesus. Jesus looking out and seeing a great crowd coming towards him says to Philip, 
Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And he asked this, listen to this. Jesus asked this only to test him, for he had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him out of his humanity, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy everyone enough bread to have just a bite. Can you hear it? His octave goes up a little because he's like, we're going to be so broke. He can't understand it. Another of his disciples, another of Jesus' disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he spoke up and he said, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two little fishes. Pushes him forward and there's a little boy with his lunchbox, right? And he has two fish. But how far will these go among so many? So the question's rhetorical. I mean, this is what we have. It's clearly not enough. And Jesus said, have the people sit down. Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. That's only counting the men. So there, there had to be, I don't know, I don't want to guess, but I know there were at least 5,000 men. G- Jesus then took the bread, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated. At, now notice, not a bite, which Philip was worried about giving them just a bite. As much as they wanted He gave them their fill, and he did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather all the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw this sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. So when we look at that, we can see that poor Philip was given a test, but it was more of a test for Philip to understand his limitations than it was for Jesus. Jesus wasn't concerned about what he was going to do. He already had in mind what he would do. He wanted his disciple to see something different. Jesus didn't wonder what to do. But Philip, with his intellect and his connections or physical abilities, saw no option to feed the people. He he had a limited view. And sometimes when Jesus tests you, it stings. I think Philip was probably a little embarrassed, right? A little embarrassed because it had to be a corrective moment where he was like, yeah, I didn't see that through your lens. I saw it only through mine. And I think Jesus was teaching him, when you see me, see things possible. See redemption bigger. See opportunity bigger. Like Jesus is trying to get into his head that he will change everything with the smallest thing. So when we see this, we can realize Philip probably felt the sting of the test, that he failed the test. It stings because you fail. I want you to know something, church church, you are going to fail greatly in trying to serve Jesus. I love failing forward. I'm still fighting for it to be a value in this church because I think when we fail forward in faithful obedience to God, there is no failure. There's moments of growth. There's opportunities to see things through Jesus' lens. And sometimes the only way we learn is to, is to fail is to just fail with it. It stings like the moment before, um, before you, like honestly, like for me, as a quarterback in high school, I will never forget. I stepped back one time, I threw this ball, I threw a dart. I was like, whoosh, I threw it, and my finger hit the helmet of a linebacker coming at me. And this finger made a hard right. And I was like, ah! and I freaked out, because it stung so bad, and my instant impulse was to go, and I was like, oh. I can see spots. It hurt so bad and it stung, but I still can feel the tension in that when I grabbed it and popped it and I could hear it in my head, like everything kind of straining and then it went and stunk back in. I was like, oh, and I could move it. It hurt terribly, but when it moved back into joint, it could work again. It could work again and correction oftentimes feels like that sting, but I'll tell you this, we are out of joint with Jesus, and it stings when he puts us back in joint, but he does that because he wants us to function in the fullness of his capacity, not yours. He doesn't need your capacity. He needs you to see his. He needs you to see him as Lord. Jesus didn't shame Philip. Instead, he, now get this, this is so good. He walked him through a miracle, 
One of the best parts about my dad is when he taught me how to do drywall and stuff, he would walk me through the process. It drove me nuts. He'd show me how to do something and he would pretty much do the whole job. I'd be like, why can't I have a chance to spread? He He did drywall on the side. And I'd be like, why can't I mud something? And he would leave me a last little section and that's when I'd realize that's why he didn't let me because I'd be like, nah, and I just, I was terrible. But he would do most of it and he would show me, he would walk me through the process. He taught me things, and I needed to see them. Jesus walked Philip through a miracle. He said, hey, what do you think we should do? I don't know, Jesus, I think we can't even get him a bread and a piece of bite to eat, and what do we do? Uh It got really awkward. He didn't know how to handle it. He was past his depth, but Jesus wasn't. So Jesus then walked him through it peacefully, quietly, at ease. And then he said, pick up the scraps I don't want to waste the food that's left over. And Philip had to be like, what just happened? But Jesus walked him through a miracle. Everyone was fed, including Philip. Philip ate his fill. That's kind of funny, Philip. (laughs) Anyways, I'm sorry. That's what happens when you have ADD. But here's the thing. Remember, these lives of ours that are hidden with Christ in God have moments where Jesus intersects us time and again. So if you have lived a life where you knew Jesus young, you've had these growth moments, you've had these challenges, have you responded and let him reset the joint of your life so that you're not dislocated from him, but he sets you out there straight again. He gets you straightened out. Some of these moments, and this is important, They're not for all the world to see. No, they're not the amazing witness stories of people like, you know, leaving terrible lives of crime and stopping horrible things and doing all this. No. But they are stories of a life transformed, and they're not for the world to see. It's a very intimate relationship between Jesus and one who has known him for a long time. They're private moments between you and him when he does the close work that only he can do. It's an intimacy. So what that tells me is since there's an intimacy, it goes deeper than just what we do. It goes to our motives. And Jesus will purify your motives. In John 12, um, 20 to 26, it says this. Now, and this is really cool because we see the motives of Philip in this. We see some of his brokenness. It says this. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at a festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. And Jesus replied, now get this, Greeks, important people, want to meet Jesus. And they go and tell Jesus, hey, some people want to see you. So imagine that. Hey, somebody wants to see you. This is what Jesus says in return. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant must, will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. So did you notice that in the scripture? These Greeks who culturally are a big deal. Hellenization, the Greeking of the world was a big deal. It was the universal language of sophistication and understanding at that time religion and government. They came up with democracy, right? They were the super intelligentsia. They were really good, like really great cultural people. And they wanted to see Jesus. And when Philip goes in with Andrew kind of excited, like, Jesus, the Greeks want to talk to us. It's a big deal to them. And what does Jesus do? He says to them, if you want to serve me, if you want want to be near me, you got to serve. He starts talking about service. Not who comes to you, how famous you get, how great you are, how big your bank is. None of that. Jesus wanted none of it. He said to them, look. Anybody who's with me is a servant. That's who I am. He showed them and purified their motives in that moment. The Greeks, with all their um, influence, or Jesus, come and serve. Come and serve. It was a different thing, and it revealed that their motives, their excitement for what they were presenting to Jesus betrayed 
their own motives, that they wanted to be more important. And let's be honest, we all want that. Jesus is such a good friend to us. Have you ever been there? I'll be honest, I have. I've been there where you think you've arrived at that moment when you feel important, where you feel successful, where you feel like you've kind of reached that rung you had always dreamed of, or you're doing something. Maybe you've arrived in this life. You've hit, you know, you're like, yeah, look, look, I'm doing it, I'm good. And you feel really good, and Jesus lovingly comes on and kind of like he did with Philip, puts his hand on your shoulder and reminds you it's not all about the culture loving you. It's about service to Jesus. It's about having your eyes on him, getting truly excited in your heart and soul and spirit about someone who doesn't know Jesus coming to faith rather than someone who's got a lot to offer you coming into your atmosphere and providing you with something. Has Jesus ever done that where he puts his hand on your shoulder or he whispers in your ear in your spirit and reminds you in that strong but kind voice, this isn't what it's about. You're missing me amid all the stuff. This isn't what it's about. What a good friend Jesus is. What a kindness he extends. It's, I mean, the way I would say it is he kind of comes along when uh, when we're believing our own press and thinking we're great and he's like, don't believe the press. Don't believe the press. What did it say when everybody was loving Jesus that he didn't entrust himself to them for he knew what was in the heart of man. He knew the people screaming his praises would one day shout crucify him. He knows how fickle the crowd is and he reminds Philip of his motives in this. How kind is that? How loving is it that he would reveal in gentleness and then purify your motives? Do you see that? Like, do you see what what a monument that can be in your life that Jesus purifies your your motives and you can look back and remember that's right. By nature, I'm sinful, so I'm gonna want these things, but Jesus changed that in me. He changed that in me. You can look back to the moments of growth in your life as these moments where he grew you and changed you. These things that Jesus does in our life. But there's another thing he does that sits aside like a standing stone. And it's this, Jesus calls you forward. And I think this is so important. So important that we get this, that Jesus calls us forward. And I love the fact that oftentimes the sound of God moving is the sound of rushing wind or rushing violent waters. I love that image. Being from out west and seeing rushing waters and stuff, you would see these these mountain streams just going down the mountain in such a hurry, and they were moving so quickly, you knew you could probably drink out of them. You could drink out of them as fast-moving water. But you go to a stagnant pond, you're like, you know what? I'm gonna get a belly full of that. You know what you're gonna get? Jardia. It's called Jardia. It's a worm, and it hurts, right? You're gonna get very sick. You don't drink stagnant water. If you're out hiking, you don't touch it. You know that it's, that it's fetid, it's bad, it's, it's gonna make you very sick. You'll be worse off with it than you are without it. You don't touch stagnant water. You want water that's moving. It may look like the river or lake is clean, but there's things going on in it in stagnant water that make it filthy and toxic to the body. In our faith, we must keep growing. That's why I think, um, and this is something that resonates in me, as a biblical Pentecostal, I think it's important that we need to have the sound of rushing waters in our life. We need the Spirit of God moving through us and keeping us moving, keeping us growing. What was okay a year ago shouldn't be okay now. What was good by you 10 years ago doesn't cut it anymore, not because you're a more moral person, but because you're someone who is moving forward. As Scripture would say, you are going from glory to glory becoming more and more like Christ and less and less like you. You decrease that he may increase. We see this and we understand that you, um, that you don't just do things for morality. You become something because Jesus by his spirit is moving you forward, compelling you forward, calling you forward. Will you stay in motion? You don't measure yourself by anyone else's growth. Well, at least I'm not like that dude. No, that's not how it works. You measure yourself by the calling of Christ and against where you were and where you're going. Are you growing in Christ? 
You need to measure yourself on Jesus. We are not being transformed again into our best self. We're being transformed into Jesus, the image of Christ. He will call you forward. He will call you deeper. He didn't let Philip stay in the status quo. And there's a kindness in that. There's a kindness that happens in that. He calls us forward to something maybe we can't understand, something that's bigger than us, something that may be hard for us to grapple with or understand, but he calls us forward to hear it and to believe him. Listen to what he says in John chapter 14, verses one to 14, talking to his disciples. Listen to the gentleness of Jesus, calling them, moving them forward towards a vision that he has that they can't yet see. Do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus said. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms, and if that were not so, I would have told you that I am I would not have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. So he's saying, my father's house has all this room for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. That where I am, you may also be. So much Jewish bridegroom language here. This is a cultural thing. He, he's telling them, he, he's, I'm the bridegroom. You guys, the church is my bride. It's really awesome imagery. But it says, you know the place where I am going. And Thomas, the disciple, says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can, we, how can we know the way? And Jesus answered him, and you'll hear me say this the rest of my life. It's one of my favorite verses. Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's the great absolute of who Jesus is. He's not saying I'm a way to God. He's saying I'm the way to God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except for me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is beyond Jewish concept. Their minds would have been blown by this. Philip said, Lord, Show us the Father and that will be enough. That's Philip's quick line. He's like, oh, because he knows in Jewish significance, no one sees God. Moses saw God and he, came, he saw the back of God and he came off the mountain glowing. Philip's like, show us, show us the Father. He wants to see him. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after, after I've been with you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. And he hearkens us back to that mountainside where Philip saw such a small symbol of what could happen. Lord, it would take half a year's wages to feed these people one bite. And Jesus is like, give me a little kid's lunch, I'll feed them all. And Jesus is saying, if you can't believe what I'm telling you, remember what I've done. Remember who I've shown you I am. Remember bigger than you're capable of believing. And he says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And Jesus had watched Philip learn to trust him. He had watched Philip grow as he believed in seeing the miracles and seeing the signs. He, he watched him as he abandoned his life and served people with Jesus. He watched him, but Jesus didn't let, let Philip think that he had finished the race. He knew that Philip had to charge forward. Jesus didn't send Philip away as a failure when he made a mistake when he was young. He didn't let him stay in wrong understandings. Jesus is too kind and too loving to let that happen. He encouraged his faith, believe Believe that I and the Father are one. Believe it. Believe that I am God. Believe that I will be with you. Believe that this is bigger than you, but it's not bigger than me. Believe and you will do amazing things, even more than I've done. If you believe in the miracles and so believe in me, know this, your miracles will be even greater. Jesus is calling them to believe. If these moments are happening in your life, there is proof and it is fruit that Jesus is walking with you. You're walking with the Lord. If you have never had Jesus calling you forward into a belief beyond what you could conceive, I don't know if you're walking with the Lord or enjoying a pet religion. And I don't mean that rudely. But let's never pretend that we can't deceive ourselves by knowing enough about Jesus to think 
we've received him as he was sent as Savior and Lord. He's calling P, uh, um, Philip to a belief. So he called him forward, correcting understanding, purifying motives, growing him, and transforming him. No one is called and then stays the same forever. Philip's life is evident of it. He was called and his life grew and grew and grew. His motives were changed, right? He had moments of growth and he was called forward again and again and again. Where are you today? Where are you today? What is required of you? How has God gotten your attention? Through his spirit, through his word? How has he gotten your attention? Is it time for you to start following, courageously following God? You may be at that simple moment of encountering Jesus, and if you're sitting here and you're like, oh, I want him, trust me, there's a moment. We have prayer people up on the side afterwards. We'd love to pray with you. The thing that brings me greatest joy in ministry is when someone gives their life to Jesus. If you want to know him, come and do that. Come and do it today. But you also may be in an intersection for a moment of growth, and you need to follow that and obey Jesus in a moment of growth, or a moment where your motives are purified, or a moment of stepping out. So let's do it. Let's look at it real quick. Is Jesus calling you to a moment of growth? I think many of us are right there. Believe in his power to do that growth, not yours. Fix your eyes on him, the author and perfecter of your faith. Do that and experience that hope. Is Jesus purifying your motives? You and I have broken motives. I have broken motives. When I buy chicken at Chick-fil-A for my friends here at the church, I like to go and get it. Why? Because I get the points. And when I get points, I get a higher status, and it drives Matt Coomin crazy. But my motives, right? My motives can be funny and like, okay, maybe a little. But also, our motives can be very broken, and we need to look at that and know that maybe you've been doing things for the wrong reasons. He will correct that. He loves you too much to live you, let you live deceived. Are you serving to look good? Aligning yourself with some ministry or some person for prestige or some visual effect in your life, but you have no relationship with Jesus. Are you going to church because your parents want you to and they'll pay for your college if you do it? I don't know what your motives are. Jesus wants to get to the bottom of them and get your motive on him. Is Jesus calling you forward? Is he calling you to keep growing? Yes, he is. He has said, yes, you've walked with me, but the old mindset is wrong. Your mentality is wrong on this. He will correct things. He calls you beyond it. He's pointing out areas where maybe you've trusted and, idolat and had idolatry for different things, and he's calling it out of you. He's calling you for it, forward. I'll close with these words. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may, may ask anything in my name and I will do it. My prayer for you is this, that you would whisper the prayer, grow me purify me and call me forward, that you would take the moment and pray the most courageous prayer of all. Grow me, Lord. It'll cost you. Grow me, Lord. Purify me, Lord. It'll cost you. And call me forward. Oh, man, there's no life more beautiful than the life of a saint who has been grown, who has been purified, and who is living like a rushing stream like a rushing stream into desert and dry lands with the gospel running out of their lives. Psalm 46 talks about a river that makes glad the city of God, a river that brings life. You are the river. You are the river of God, making glad this, the world around you. The world is seeing the gospel alive. I invite you, feel this challenge to be grown, to be purified, and then to answer the call forward, ever forward, from glory to glory, for his glory and for his fame. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your word. I pray that you would call us forward in you. I pray that you would pour your spirit into us. I pray that you would intersect us at moments of growth, at moments of purifying our motives, at moments of calling us forward. And for those of us who are new in faith, I pray that you would, you would intersect our lives and say, come follow me, and that we, like Philip, would get up and follow you with great faith, knowing there's so much to learn and such an amazing life ahead of us. Lord Jesus Christ, it is you who we love, you who we trust, and you who we worship. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for pointing us to, th to yourself, so much bigger than our small minds could ever conceive. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So God calls us to be transformed into his image. And each one of us is in a different place in our faith journey. Maybe some of us this morning, we're on the fence of giving our life to Jesus Christ. And Jesus will constantly pursue us and he's asking us, will we follow him? And maybe that question we need to answer this morning, will you follow me? We need to say yes, because that's going to allow the transformation to begin. And so if that's you this morning, I encourage you to take that step. Maybe you're at a place this morning where you've been doing things all out of the wrong motives. Maybe you serve to look good, or maybe you've been just climbing the corporate ladder and, and, and you um, have been chasing after the worldly dreams. And so maybe you need to confess this morning to the Lord saying, Lord, um, I need your help. Um, show me how to, how to change the way I'm living. Or maybe this morning God's calling you to do something crazy that makes zero sense in this world. And maybe you need to take that step of faith and step into that um, and, and trust that when you do that, that transformation will happen. So I know as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to move forward. We're not called to stay the same. We need to continue to go from glory to glory. And so I challenge you this morning, what is that step God is calling you to do? And maybe you don't know right now. So take this week, pray about it, ask the Lord, Lord, what step do I need to take to grow in my faith walk with you, to grow in my relationship with you? And as you go from here, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you would like prayer, if you'd like to pray with somebody this morning or have a prayer request, you can text the keyword Foundry Online to 94000 and press the number 3 key. And somebody on our prayer team will get back with you shortly. Happy Father's Day to all of you dads out there, and thank you for worshiping with us this morning. I hope that you have a great week.